Be careful what you wish for. More vaccines and stimulus point toward recovery, but it looks like it's going to be a bumpy ride. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, not one, but two former Treasury secretaries, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard and Jack Lew of Lindsey Goldberg. I think there's still a need for a big, big package. Johnson & Johnson CEO Alex Gorski. We will have done 100 million doses by the end of June and uh, near a billion by the end of 2021. Former chair of the FDIC, Sheila Baer. A physical location, I think, is an advantage uh, that, that Walmart could provide and a benefit to that segment of the population that still wants, a, wants a, an actual banking physical space. Former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Laura Tyson. Katie Nixon of Northern Trust Management. And Bindia Vakil of Resolink. It was a week of contradictions. Johnson & Johnson brought us a new vaccine and President Biden said we'd all be vaccinated by the end of May. This country will have enough vaccine supply, I'll say it again, for every adult in America by the end of May. But health experts warned we could trigger another spike of the pandemic if we all go the way of Texas and declare things back to normal. This must end. It is now time to open Texas 100%. Federal Reserve officials continue to insist that the spike in bond yields is just optimism about what's coming. But it hit tech stocks particularly hard, with the Nasdaq falling nearly 3% on Wednesday alone. And the Senate moved closer to that $1.9 trillion stimulus package. We're on track to send the American Rescue Plan to the president's desk before the expiration of the enhanced unemployment benefit, which occurs on March 14th. But inflation expectations went higher than they have been since 2008. And the markets, well, the markets reflected all of those conflicting signals, with the S&P headed toward a third week down in a row with really strong jobs numbers raising concerns about inflation. But then, then late on Friday, it turned around to finish up for the week. The tech-heavy Nasdaq tried to come back on Friday as well, but it had suffered just too much throughout the week, although it did manage to pull up above the level of a correction. And the 10-year yield showed that it wasn't just technical factors that drove it higher last week, all the way up to 1.5 percent at the end of this week. To take us through these volatile markets and the big surprise in jobs numbers, we welcome now Laura Tyson. She's former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and now professor at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and Katie Nixon, chief investment officer for Northern Trust wealth management. Welcome to both of you. Great to have you back with us. Katie, let me start with you. It feels like a sort of upside down world. Tech had been up forever. Now it's way down this week. In the meantime, we're seeing things like energy and financials really move up. Is this something for the future? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily that the world is going to stay upside down forever, but I do think that there are some really visible reasons why we're seeing this, this rotation trade. And David, some of them really have legs. So if we break it down, uh, clearly the macro story uh, has become really strong. So we have global growth expectations increasing here in the U.S. Obviously, obviously we're expecting a big second half of 2021 and into 2022. Um, so fundamentals there look look quite strong and these fundamentals tend to to raise all boats but some boats are are a little more buoyant than others and the, the value trade has a little bit more beta uh, to the higher growth outlook we also have a little bit more inflation which tends to be good for sectors that tend to be in the value area like energy as you referenced bank banks for example are enjoying the the, the steeper yield curve but then I think there's a, a real fundamental tailwind here as well as we're actually expecting the growth uh, in earnings for value companies to outgrow growth companies in 2021 and 2022. And then you layer on top of that the relative valuation uh, between uh, value and growth, where we see value still selling, even though there's been a rebound, still selling at a pretty steep discount to their growth counterparts. So it's kind of the stars are aligned right now for this rotation trade into value. But I guess I would, would end by saying, uh, you know, we don't want to ignore our, our good growth stocks. Um, clearly, you know, there's secular uh, tailwinds that are very, very strong there. These are cash flow generators, uh, behemoths. Uh, so for us, when we think about the rotation trade and the growth versus value, it's not necessarily an either or, but probably a both and. 
Uh, so, so, Laura, one of the things that's driving a lot of things right now in the markets is that 10-year yield, which spiked up last week. People said it might be technical. This week, it's pretty clear it's not technical. It's up over 1.5 percent now. And the question, I guess, on many people's minds is what's driving that? Is that fear of inflation or is that simply we think everything's coming back to normal, more or less? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, as a, a former, you know, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and looking at all forecasts all the time, the greatest area of uncertainty in any forecast is really the forecast of interest rates. So let's just start there. there and, and, and the profession has not been great at timing either direction or uh, at uh, amount. So I do think, I do think that what is happening uh, to the 10-year rate right now reflects a sense that the economy's recovery is strong, solid, will continue, that it will pick up pace at the end of this year, and that there will be, as a consequence of that, some uh, uptick in inflation. There is a debate about whether that will be transient or permanent. Uh, uh, Chairman Powell has said strongly he believes it will be transient. But nonetheless, if you look at uh, inflation expectations indicators, which I think in this world with a flat Phillips curve in the last 10 years, the best uh, sort of predictor of what's going to happen to inflation probably is inflation expectations. Sure, they're rising. They're rising. So you sort of see a 10-year rate of maybe 2.5% inflation. You see a five-year rate of maybe slightly above that. Uh, the point is, yes, I think the driver here is an expectation of the economy's recovery being strong, picking up pace that driving up to some extent the rate of inflation, and that is what is being reflected uh, in long-term interest rates right now. However, the you know look at those numbers. If a inflation expectation of two, two point two percent, two point five percent, and is not an expectation which leads one to worry. If you take the Fed, and I do at its word that it would like to see us in a long-term situation of a 2%, uh, a 2 inflation rate, and that they would be willing for some time to allow the rate to move above that because we've been so long, so far below it, let the economy recover, let the rate move up a bit, uh, and we will continue, and they said a very strong signal to the bond market this week, we're, we're not changing our policy. We are not changing our policy. This is our policy. Our policy is to stay at the near zero short term rate we are at, to stay with our quantitative easing policy now, because we believe there's still a lot of room and need for monetary with fiscal policy support to get to maximum employment. So, Laura, let me do something that we do in media, which is totally unfair, which is ask you a question, and I need a short answer, even though there is no short answer, which is, <laughs> oh, no. is it inevitable, Laura, that we're going to have a temper tantrum sooner or later? I'll ask the same question to Katie. Well, I think I do not know the answer to that question because I would like a technical definition of what you mean by temper tantrum. I mean, I guess I would say the following. What, 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 what Powell has said is, He's not, he's, he's not surprised uh, that interest rates, uh, that, that he's seen this movement in the bond market. What he is, the thing that he will have to think, worry about, pay attention to, is it does it become disorderly. He has to worry about the underlying financial market conditions. Uh, he does not see any evidence of that right now. Um, so I think uh, I would say I would rather use pay attention right. to underlying financial market conditions, see if they become disorderly, another term we do not have a technical definition for, <laughs> by the way, uh, and, and then uh, make uh, adjustments if necessary. But, but, but I, I really yeah. want to go back to my first point again. Right which is um, if we define temper tantrum or disorderly in terms of just a movement at a particular interest rate, a 10-year rate, boy, that is something that our forecasts find really hard to predict. Thanks so much to Laura Tyson and to Katie Nixon. Coming up, Walmart as your friendly neighborhood bank. We talk with former FDIC head Sheila Baer about the risks and the opportunities. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. When 
don't care what they do as a retailer, but we are concerned about the safety and soundness of the financial system. And this doesn't just relate to Walmart, it's any commercial industrial company uh, getting into banking and the threats it can potentially cause. That was former Ohio Congressman Paul Gilmore in 2007 after Walmart's failed attempt to get into banking. 14 years later, Walmart may be taking another look at taking on Wall Street, this time with two veterans from Goldman Sachs Consumer Finance Division. They left Goldman this week to join a fintech startup backed by Walmart and Rivet Capital. Omar Ismail was the head of Goldman's consumer bank named Marcus, launched in 2016. It was meant to get Goldman into the consumer business, but it's been slow to gain traction. We want to be the leading digital banking platform. And the idea behind this is that we can be someone's holistic bank. Efforts by retailers and startups to begin offering core banking products pits FinTech against Wall Street. FinTech, big tech, you saw Walmart recently. So we just have to be prepared for intensified competition. We're, we're ready for it. We're very competitive and we expect to win. Walmart has been trying to get into the banking business since the late 1990s. It first tried unsuccessfully to buy a bank in California. Then it tried again in 2005, applying for an industrial bank charter in Utah, which it hoped to use to process credit and debit card transactions internally. But the retailer faced a firestorm of opposition from lawmakers and banking industry groups. After two years and several delays, Walmart ultimately withdrew its application. What we're trying to do here is to get people to be really open to embracing what's next. Sheila Baer was the head of the FDIC when the agency temporarily suspended Walmart's banking ambitions and encouraged the retailer to partner with banks instead. I asked her what is different this time around. I'm not sure much is different. Uh, there's uh, financial technology has uh, uh, created new opportunities to provide financial services, especially in the payments uh, space with, with, with larger returns. So it may be that Walmart views this uh, as attractive. A lot of the, the policy arguments are the same. I think financial technology perhaps makes this more attractive now to Walmart. Uh, I can only speculate. They haven't really provided much public information about what their plans are. As you say, most of the regulatory agencies disfavor a commercial entity right. owning a bank. There is an exception right. in this industrial bank, sort of an interesting right. phenomenon. Uh, right. What are the risks from not having the full regulatory force mm -hmm. yeah. applied to something like a Walmart? So, yeah, so I think, uh, so their concentration of power, I think the, the traditional prohibition we've had on this is, is the concentration of power of commercial, very large commercial entities, you know, being able to uh, build banking empires too. That's that's a lot of concentrated power. So I think that's an issue. Also, uh, the impact on community banks, you know, given Walmart, you know, could provide a lot of competition. Uh, I think there's a fear there uh, that they could really hurt uh, community banks. So that's really uh, uh, the policy arguments against it. You mentioned, Sheila, the possible squeeze on local and community banks if the right. Walmarts of this world get into that business. Could there also be a squeeze on the bigger banks as a practical matter, as more well, and more big yeah. commercial entities come into their neighborhood and compete with them, for example, for deposit taking? Yeah, well, there could very well be. And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's that may be a benefit. Uh, it's uh, one, you know, we've had with this terrible pandemic, we've had an accelerating trend towards you know, a lot of branches closing, remote provision of, of financial services. It's less cost. It's, it doesn't involve people personally interacting with each other, which has become an issue with this pandemic. But there are still a lot of people who want a physical location to go to for their banking services. And Walmart can provide that with all its stores. Uh, elderly people, you know, people, lower income people who don't have access to the internet. The, the ability to also provide not just uh, technolog technologically remote services, but also a physical location, I think, is an advantage uh, that, that Walmart could provide and a benefit to that segment of the population that still wants, a, wants a, an actual banking physical space to go to. So yes, and in that context, their, their vast array of stores could be highly competitive with these larger banks' uh, branch operations. So it's, you're right, it's not clear that it would just be an impact to, on community banks. Well, you raise a very interesting possibility, I think. We have talked for some time about the unbanked and the underbanked in the United right. States, typically in poor communities, you suggest, yes. suggest uh, and how we address that. We haven't been successful terribly in doing that. Could a Walmart moving in actually help address that problem in the country? 
Well, I think they could. I mean, I think lower income and lower middle income Americans are, are, are a very big part of Walmart's uh, uh, customer base. And so they're coming to those stores already. So, yeah, I mean, I think we need to know what Walmart plans. <laughs> if they just plan to, you know, fatten their profit margins, well, good for them. But, you know, that's not really a public policy reason to provide the charter, approve the charter. But if, yeah, if they can leverage that reach that they have with the unbanked and underbanked populations to provide a fuller panoply of financial services at low cost, at mainstream cost, right? So people can go to payday lenders and pawn shops now and get financial services at a very high cost. But if Walmart uh, can democratize, uh, further democratize credit and banking services and provide at the same cost that you and I get, then I think that would be hugely beneficial. So you know, we need to stay tuned in terms of what Walmart uh, is, uh, what the value proposition is that they're contemplating, but there's certainly a lot of potential there. Well, we'll talk about that value proposition. We can't get in Doug McMillan's head, I don't think. Certainly I no. can't. Uh, but he's made no secret of the fact that he's interested in moving into this. Why do you think that is? Because Walmart does, is at least part of a lot of financial services offered to yeah. its customers right now through yeah. distribution arrangements with regular yeah. banks, but also through direct uh, relationships with its own customers. Well, it, it is. It is some crowded space, uh, but I, you know, I think there's probably a lot of money to be made by again internalizing it as opposed to doing it through through bank partnerships. It's interesting. They seem to be really focused on financial technology. Is part, you know, they're talking about creating a, some type of fintech uh, entity, which in that's pretty crowded space already. It, it seems to me that they're stronger. Uh, they're, they're the greater strength in this. Their competitive strength is their stores, right? They have physical locations. They can provide that. And they have a customer base that's, that's ready-made. They can, those unbanked and underbanked that the mainstream uh, banking uh, organizations have not been able to reach, they're their customers already. So it seems to me that's their benefit, not so much as utilizing financial technology uh, that can help lower the cost of providing the services, but their, their strength is their pre-existing customer base and their physical facilities. That was Sheila Baer, former head of the FDIC. Coming up, Johnson & Johnson joins the COVID vaccine club, and its CEO, Alex Gorski, is the first to say he couldn't have done it on his own. It's all about partnerships, and look, we're partnering and we're working hand in hand with the U.S. government. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Maybe the most important development of the week, not just for markets, but for all of us, was Johnson & Johnson joining the elite club of approved vaccine providers, adding its millions of doses to the battle against COVID. We talked to J&J chairman and CEO Alex Gorski about how they did it and how fast they can get that vaccine into people's arms. From the very beginning, we tried to look at how could we design a, the very best possible vaccine in terms of safety, efficacy, dosing, and, and frankly, administration and logistics. And, uh, and we had a platform that had been used in more than 100,000 patients that gave us a lot of confidence that the safety profile was very strong. Uh, we tested it thoroughly. And what's really important about our test, uh, David, our clinical trials, was we didn't start until September. And so just as we had come out of what I would say the low point over the summer, and we started seeing cases increase, certainly across the United States, but more importantly around the world, that's when our trial began. So we were really into you know, the, the heat of the, of the virus spread. So give us a sense about getting into people's arms, because now you have the vaccine, we're all eager to get it uh, and to protect us. Uh, you've got, as I understand, about four million doses ready to go. They came out of your Dutch facility. Are there manufacturing issues in Baltimore? Are you concerned at all about that? No, look, we're, we're on track with our plans. We do have approximately 4 million, 3.9 that are literally on trucks right now being rolled out in the United States. We expect to do 20 million in March. Uh, and, and look, over the next several weeks, we've got to go through regulatory approvals uh, and a few other uh, processes. Uh, but then we really expect to hit a very strong cadence, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can be doing we will have done 100 million doses by the end of June and um, near a billion by the end of 2021 en route to a path of almost 2 billion by 2022. 
Uh, so um, it's, it's been a remarkable achievement here, too. And while, while the discovery and the development of the vaccine, uh, I think, has been really impressive, at the same time, we've had to scale up these manufacturing facilities. In this case, David, what you, the site you were mentioning, it was a parking lot <laughs> eight or nine months ago. Today, it's one of the most advanced biopharmaceutical manufacturing facilities in the world. But, but Alex, when you have the $4 million or the $20 million or the $100 million, who do you call to say, where should I ship them? Well, right now, it's directly to the government. So in the United States, the government determines, uh, as you may have seen on some of the footage today, it goes from uh, basically our, man, uh, our distribution facility and UPS trucks to McKesson, and then the government works very closely to distribute it to the states. They're working closely with the governors as well as with some of the large retail chains. And, you know, the good news is, David, I think now that we have a third vaccine out there, and, and by the way, kudos to Pfizer and Moderna for also significantly increasing their output. I would predict that in the second quarter, we're no longer going to be near a supply constraint. And as we get more doses out, we're going to be able to open up some of the requirements and restrictions regarding who can get the vaccine and who can't. And as a result, our throughput will go up. And I think we're going to see a big difference about the number of patients being vaccinated in the second quarter around our country, let alone the world. That was Johnson & Johnson Chairman and CEO Alex Gorski. Now it's time for a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. David, as vaccination campaigns kick off around the world with a rough average of 6.5 million doses administered per day, that has framed the conversation around repricing in global bond markets for rates to lift off earlier than expected. Tenure yields in Asia have been backing up since the end of January, and we're watching to see if central banks will act to cap borrowing costs. Now, the BOJ has pushed back on speculation it will widen its yield target range ahead of next week's final reading on Japan's fourth quarter GDP. And as markets assess the policy signals from China's National People's Congress, next week's inflation and credit data will shed more light on China's recovery. And on the earnings calendar, we get insights across key sectors with Cathay Pacific, Top Glove, Prada, and JD.com due to report. Danny? Thanks, Sophie. Well, the week kicks off in the UK with some easing of restrictions and schools reopening. But by Thursday, all eyes turn to Lagarde and the ECB, where they meet and update their forecast. And the discussion will likely be around higher bond yields and whether they need to do anything about it. Romaine? Thank you, Danny. Financial markets are taking their cues from what's going on in the bond market with yields on the 10-year Treasury rising as much as 20 basis points during the past week. That sets the stage for next week, the week ahead, where the Treasury is slated to sell three-year, 10-year, and 30-year bonds. It will be interesting to see how investors receive those new sales and whether that puts more upward pressure on yields. That upward pressure has potential ripple effects for the equity markets and in the currency markets. Investors also keep an eye on what's going on with that $1.9 trillion stimulus bill and now concerns about whether that could stoke inflation. The consumer price index numbers, that will arrive on Wednesday, and wholesale producer price numbers, those arrive on Thursday. David? Thanks to Sophie, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, what broke the supply chain on chips just when we needed it most? We talk with supply chain expert Bindia Vakil of Resilink. The problem is that we have a globally stretched supply chain that also embraced lean in a big way and just in time. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The world's manufacturing supply chains are showing signs of strain and semiconductors, or chips, are among the hardest hit. The combination of the pandemic, policy decisions, and the growing demand for electric vehicles created a perfect storm for the industry. This is an industry issue. Of course, we're working every single day with a cross-functional team to look for opportunities of how do we minimize the impact. In January, Honda said it will cut domestic output at one of its Japanese factories, while Nissan is adjusting production of its Note hatchback model. GM announced this week that it's extending temporary shutdowns at three of its North American plants because of the ongoing semiconductor shortage. The first quarter, uh, we have had some uh, disruptions and idled some of our plants, but it is still a volatile situation. It's not just car makers. A shortage of chips affects everything from 5G phones to medical devices. Combination of the coronavirus and the, the impact on 
not to be too technical, the entity list, but the ability of American companies to sell to us and others, it's really had a very negative effect on us. The shortage has gotten so bad that President Biden stepped in this week with an executive order directing a government-wide supply chain review for critical goods. We need to make sure these supply chains are secure and reliable. I'm directing senior officials in my administration to work with industrial leaders to identify solutions to this semiconductor shortfall. The problem has been brewing since 2019, and President Donald Trump's trade war with China also played a part in the supply crunch. Roughly 10% of the world's chip production comes from SMIC, a semiconductor company that's partially owned by the Chinese government. In 2020, the U.S. restricted American companies from selling to SMIC. So by dealing with the availability of high-tech, particularly semiconductors, to Huawei and to ZTE, we've slowed that down. To get a better sense of just how bad the problem is and what can be done about it, we talk with Bindia Vakil, CEO of Resilink, the leading provider of supply chain mapping services. And she said that the problem has been a long time coming. This has been building since last year. And now we are looking at an extremely constrained environment. It started with two big factory fires at Japanese semiconductor plants, one in July, one in October. Then there were some labor strikes at chip making facilities in Europe. And then you combine that with the upheaval from COVID. We had fires in California, record hurricane season, winter storms, the container issues that we have experienced, container shortages. And then we saw Boeing 777 grounding, which, ground, which affects air shipment capacity and just last week we heard that in Taiwan there is a water shortage that is creating constrained water supplies which are very essential for wafer fabrication assembly operations so it's a very interesting situation right now now we have the Biden administration saying we're going to get our arms around this we're going to start with information making sure we know what's going on something I think you may have some insight into in Resolink is that the right first step Absolutely. In fact, I would say the direction that the government is going with supply chain right now, they first, uh, most critical, they have called supply chain resilience a matter of national security. This is the first thing that they needed to do, and they have do finally done it. Um, understanding the supply chain landscape, who the critical players are, what are the global sites and regions that are critical to the supply chain, this is the first step in helping us make informed decisions about what are those sources of constrained supply that we need to address, where we need to hold backup supplies, where we need to hold extra inventory, and what it is that we need to do to avoid the similar problems that we experienced in PPE shortages last year that brought the healthcare industry to their knees. So it's really critical and, and mapping supply chains and understanding those global dependencies is the first step. Have we been spending too little on our supply chain? Because as I listen to you and as you talk about increased inventories, increased capacity, that sounds like money, that we, in fact, we've been running at too tight a tolerance. Absolutely. Well, the first thing we did in the last 20 years is we went um, overseas and uh, globalized. Not the wrong thing to do. Uh, you not only globalize your supply chain to take advantage of lo lower cost supplies, you take advantage of emerging markets and the demand there as well. But the problem is that we have a globally stretched supply chain that also embraced lean in a big way and just in time. So we now stretch the supply chain and took all the buffer out. And we failed to simultaneously provide any protection for all the things that, as I mentioned, constantly go wrong. And for far too long, supply chain risk has been a nice to have. And I think that we're seeing firsthand what happens when those types of all things go ca that can go wrong have now gone wrong, and this is what we are dealing with. So coming to something that's near and dear to my heart, what happened to the auto industry? Uh, because I interviewed Mary Barrow just a couple of weeks ago, and they're projecting next year they're going to leave a lot of money on the table because they will have a shortage of chips. Why did the auto industry particularly get caught out here? You know, automakers need to recognize your supply chains now resemble a high-tech electronic product supply chain. 
in that sector, we have major players that have long-standing relationships with those suppliers. And the high-tech industry has led the world in developing and embracing, to a great degree, some of the best-in-class supply chain practices. That was Bindia Vakil, CEO of Resilink. Coming up, former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew on the jobs numbers, the stimulus package, and whether it's possible to give the economy too much help right now. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Jobs are coming back slowly. The economy is projected to grow a lot this year to make up for that disastrous 2020. And Congress is about to add hundreds of billions more dollars in stimulus to the trillions it's already pumped in. So we asked Jack Lew, former Secretary of the Treasury, whether it was possible that we were doing too much or maybe doing it in just the wrong places. Today's jobs numbers uh, are good news, but they also show we have a very long way to go. Um, at the rate of job growth uh, that we saw today, it would take years to get back to employment levels at the point when COVID hit. And in that point, we wouldn't yet be uh, where we would have been if we'd never uh, gotten off the growth path. So it's whether you call it two, three, four years uh, ahead of us, just at this rate of growth to get back where we were. Um, if you look within the numbers, uh, wages were flat. We're not seeing uh, inflationary pressures on wages. Labor force participation uh, was not up, uh, and it shows that uh, there's still a lot of people who are out of the workforce, either because there are no jobs to be had or because they're taking care of kids who can't go to school. So I think it tells us there's still a lot of work to do, and there's still a lot of people. There's nine and a half million people who are still unemployed, and you know that's a, that's a, a big problem. So I think there's still a need for a big, big package. Uh, some of the fine tuning that's being done, uh, I think, is is, is sensible, uh, and I think it's moving in, in a good direction. But we need a big package in order to get through this and have uh, people not be hurt, businesses not be hurt, and the economy poised to grow again. As I understand it, pretty much everybody agrees something needs to be done, something substantial needs to be done. The Republicans have proposed over six hundred billion dollars. I guess my question to you is: Is it possible to do to do too much? Some people are suggesting right now it could be too much. There's a lot of money, as you know, sitting on the balance sheets of households that's not getting spent. If that all flooded into the economy, could that have some adverse effects? So I, I think you have to look at where the money is going. If people are unemployed and they're getting extended unemployment benefits, they don't have a lot of savings. They're spending what comes in just to keep their family eating and uh, with a roof over their head. If you're looking at the stimulus checks, uh, at the high end, there was a very high savings rate. And I think the decision they made to target it a little bit more, more precisely to where the need is, is a move in the right direction. Uh, in terms of household savings, there have been household savings, but it's skewed. It's it's mostly in households that are, relatively speaking, more uh, comfortable and have more assets uh, to begin with. Um, I think if you look at where the need is, the nine and a half million people unemployed, you look at the, these numbers today, uh, we still lost jobs in state and local government. Uh, we've lost a million 1.4 million jobs since the beginning of the pandemic in state and local government. So to say that there's not a need for help there, it, we're, not, we're not at that point yet. I thought the Republican package at 600 was substantially short of what was needed, substantially short. Uh, I think some of the moves that have been made in the last few days uh, show that there, there, there are modifications that can trim at the edges, but it's in the right direction. Uh, this, this is a, 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 not a science, it's an art. Um, you know, it's a question of what can get a majority of votes and what will do the most good for the economy. Um, I think there are reasons to ask questions about what it all costs, where the deficit is going, whether there's inflation to be worried about around the corner. I don't think now is the time to have that fear stop us from doing what we need to do to get through the crisis. It, it is a reason when we come out of it to ask the hard question of how do we pay for the things we need to do and how do we look ahead to be on a sustainable path. I would just say that with the 10-year rates and the 30-year rates we're looking at, debt sustainability is not a problem anytime in the near future for the United States. One has to come up with a black swan event to come up with a real crisis. 
Yeah, and I want to turn to that very important question of rebuilding the economy rather than just tidying us over. But one more question on the stimulus. I'm glad you raised the question of the state and local jobs because that really did jump out of these jobs numbers. We lost a lot of employees. At the same time, some people are worried that if we give a lot of money to the states, it may not go for employment. Didn't a version of that happen back in 2009, actually, as the money went to the states? Is there a way, as a practical matter, you've been in the room, you know, is there a way to say, fine, we're going to give you this money, but you got to employ a bunch more people? You know, it's a great question, David. Money is fungible. There's always a risk. You know, we tend to trust the states. We put requirements in. Um, can clever uh, uh, state budget planners find ways to move money around? Sometimes. I would say in the margin, it's not a big risk. It's not a big risk. It, as, a, as a political matter, it, it's, it's a very, it's a big mistake to, to come at the state level and do a tax cut when you got emergency federal spending uh, to support employment. I think there will be um, both language and uh, implementation steps taken to make that something the states don't do. Um, you know, you, you look at, the, at today's numbers, the, the, the number of people working in education isn't where we need to be to meet the current educational crisis. If we're going to have safe schools with social distancing and smaller classes, uh, that takes more people, not less people. And what we're seeing is fewer, not more people working at that level. So there's, there's a big need. Um, it, obviously, states in, over the decades have uh, taken different paths of how they've handled this. Uh, you know, federal policy has to be geared to push them all as much as possible in the right direction. That was Jack Lew, former Secretary of the Treasury. Coming up, we wrap up the week, as always, with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, and we're going to conclude our week as we do every single week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thanks so much for being back. One of the big events of the week was Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking at a Wall Street Journal event. He talked about a lot of things, including the bond yield, things like that. But one of the things he addressed was inflation. And he admitted as how they're keeping a cl close eye on it, maybe because of some of the things you've said, frankly, uh, and that they are not going to repeat the mistakes of the 60s and 70s, as he referred to it. Uh, what does he need to do to avoid that? I sure hope they don't repeat the mistakes of the 60s and 70s because they were hugely important, not just for inflation, not just for macroeconomic stability, but for the whole politics and attitude of uh, the country. They're going to need to look in hard headed ways and to be prepared to not make excuses each month, pointing to a different factor when inflation picks up. And they're going to need to remember that their priority is the macro economy. When I see them say they won't raise rates until um, diversity groups, unemployment rates are appropriate, I get nervous because the Fed can't really control those issues. Those are issues for anti-discrimination law. Those are issues for fiscal policy. Uh, those are issues for labor market uh, programs. And so if the Fed sets out to target the unemployment rate of particular groups without regard to inflation, that would be a good way to make really serious uh, inflation. If they take inflation seriously, they monitor closely, and they're prepared to cause pain, they will be able to control inflation. But if instead they say, oh, we've got credibility, inflation expectations are anchored, and inflation is not something we have to worry about. Ironically, the more optimistic they are about inflation uh, being under control, the less likely it is to actually be under control. So Fed Chair Powell gave us a little bit of a hint about how he's going to approach this, because he addressed a couple of things. He said some of the uptick in prices that we're expecting is going to be base effects, as there's a reopening effect as people come back. And also there may be some particular choke points in the supply chain. We're not going to pay much attention to those, because that's transient. How do you tell the difference between transient inflation and something more troubling? That's why they've got a staff of a few hundred economists. And precisely to make those distinctions, and they got to look at all the data they can. What I'm worried about when I hear that kind of talk 
is not that it isn't right. He's right about the base year effects. He's right about specific sectors. But every great inflation is made by a central bank that dismisses it as due to transient factors. And so at a certain point, when you start having a transient factor every month, then you maybe got a permanent factor going over going uh, overall. So it takes a lot of worry about inflation to make there not be uh, inflation. This is a classic example of self-denying prophecy. The more the Fed is fearful of inflation, the more likely they are to avoid it. The more the Fed is complacent about inflation, the more likely they are to have it. So, Larry, one of the things that's a big item on the agenda now as we are working our way through the stimulus package is infrastructure. President Biden has said that he wants to go on to that. He had meetings at the White House this week to talk about it. Uh, so we've talked in the past about the stimulus package, maybe what should have been done, what could have been done. Before we get started on infrastructure, give us some advice. How do you do it the right way and how do you do it the wrong way? Here are two broad principles, uh, David. One is Democrats are right that we need much more money on infrastructure. And Republicans are right that we need much more efficient regulation, much more rapid environmental approvals, and much more efficient uh, procurement. And we need to do a politics of both and rather than either or when it comes to infrastructure. The other thing is, this is an area where the public sector and the private sector have to uh, collaborate. Some infrastructure is public, uh, repairing the potholes in the roads in New York City. Some is private, building out um, a 5G wireless uh, system. Some is uh, joint, uh, toll roads, bridges, electric utilities, uh, and the like. We've got to find creative ways of bringing the public and private sectors together around the infrastructure uh, issues. And we need to understand that infrastructure is much more than bricks and mortar. So infrastructure is good for all of us because it makes our lives better, presumably. But there's another purpose as well, which is increased productivity as we go forward. It's future growth, essentially, we're investing in. A lot of us haven't had the experience you've had being a macroeconomist in the U.S. government. We've run companies or parts of companies. When we make a decision about capital investment, we take a look at the payback. When do we get the payback? What's the long, what's the prospects of payback? Do you look at it that way? I mean, how do you decide which projects are the most likely to really increase productivity and increase growth in the out years? I think you got to look at the overall social return. Some of that is the extra money that's going to get uh, produced. Some of that is the carbon that's going to get mitigated that otherwise would have a substantial uh, social cost. Some of that is the incremental business activity that's going uh, to be enabled. Some of that is, and it's not always easy, putting the valuation on uh, amenities that people are going to enjoy. There's a SPAC frenzy, some people think, in the country right now. And so we t treat you as an expert, which you certainly are, but let's treat you as a fact witness, the way I used to when I put witnesses on in the courtroom. You actually have gotten involved in a SPAC here, as I understand it. You're an investor in a company that now is being acquired by a SPAC. Tell us about it. It's called uh, State's Title, right? I'm on, the, I'm on the board and have been uh, an investor for a number of years. Our company has the potential to transform title insurance, the type of insurance where most of the time there's the highest ratio of premiums paid to benefits paid out. And this company is going to transform its efficiency by using uh, artificial intelligence. It's a huge business opportunity, ultimately, to transform the process of buying a house and make it pleasant and fast rather than excruciating and slow. So let's wrap this up with a rapid fire. Summer says, number one, we talked about Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve Chair earlier. Uh, do you expect him to be reappointed? He should be. He certainly should be. He's done a great job and continuity in that role is a very important thing. Uh, on the other side, we learned this week that Neera Tandon's nomination to be the Director of Office of Management of Budget has been withdrawn. You know her. Uh, who do you expect to succeed her? Nobody who will be able to do that job as well 
as uh, she could have. And finally, Larry, uh, what's the future of the minimum wage? Looks like it's not going to be part of this stimulus package. What's the future? My guess is we'll have a minimum wage that'll be way above seven twenty-five, but won't reach fifteen dollars. And I think that's probably the right kind of prudent compromise. Okay, thank you so much, Larry. That's Larry Summers, our special contributor, and of course he's from Harvard. Finally, one more thought. We lost a giant this week. And by we, I mean those who walk the corridors of power in Washington, those who sit in the boardrooms of our corporations, those who care about racial justice, those of us who care about our country. Vernon Jordan did it all, or all of it that truly matters, and he changed it all. First as a civil rights lawyer and leader at the NAACP, the United Negro College Fund, and the National Urban League. And then, when he saw we needed changing from the inside, he became an influential lawyer and lobbyist in Washington, an investment banker in New York, a corporate board director, and a close advisor to presidents. He was larger than life in every way, in his stature, in his deep baritone voice and measured tones, in that twinkle in his eye, but most of all, in his quiet moral authority that he brought to every gathering and to every decision. For those of us blessed to witness it firsthand, it was sometimes as much how he did it as what he did. A loyal and true friend, always there to listen, to remind us of our true north. At a time of so much division, so much bickering, we need a Vernon Jordan more than ever. The grace, the wisdom, and most of all, the respect he showed everyone. Respect for those he agreed with, and every bit as much for those with whom he could not agree. Yes, we lost a giant this week. I fear we will not see his like again, but I so hope that I'm wrong for all of our sakes. I believe that the new era we are facing has the potential of crossing boundaries of enormous positive possibility if we can seize the moment and act out our better impulses. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.